The truth be told, his mother was in the penitentiary while pregnant with him. In the 11th grade, we were going around to different churches, community centers, middle schools, high school graduations. He did spoken word, and I was a kid preacher. We moved down to Atlanta together, exact same day. He enrolled at Clark Atlanta University while I was down the street at the Better Choice Morehouse College. Didn't even make it full through the first semester. Homecoming came at Clark Atlanta University. Digital Underground was the guest artist. Tupac jumped on the tour bus. And from there had a meteor meteoric rise and unparalleled cultural influence. In a somber moment reflecting on his success, in spite of his circumstances, he wrote a poem entitled, The Rose That Grew From Concrete. And in that poem, A Rose That Grew From Concrete, he proclaims, did you hear about this rose that grew from a crack in the concrete, proving that nature's law is wrong, it learned to walk without having any feet. Funny, it seems, but by keeping its dreams, it learned to breathe the fresh air. Long live the rose that grew from concrete when nobody else came. The reality, friends, is that that poetry could have been his obituary. And your life story, because as quiet as it's kept, the sewer of your adolescence, topped with how hard it was for you to grow up. The reality is you deserve a trophy, a plaque, and a certificate because you've come out smelling like a rose. It is by no accident that the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, thrown into the fiery furnace. And the Bible says that the temperature was raised seven times hotter than what it ordinarily is, and still they refused to bow down. In all of your years in Sunday school, nobody ever asked, where were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's parents? Who stood up for them? Who tried to fight for them? Isn't it amazing? that in the chapter that they're thrown into the furnace, that their own mentor, Daniel, doesn't show up. The time that they needed somebody of influence and prominence to be there, they had to find out for themselves. Theologians argue that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were just between the ages of 14 and 16 and are having to make dark and difficult decisions that would impact their life journey. And still, nobody's there to defend them. I want to say this, not necessarily for you, but maybe for somebody two rows behind you, that sometimes the confirmation of the level of your anointing is how much you were attacked early. The enemy does not wait for you to mature to attack you. He attacks you before you have any semblance of who you are, hoping that he can side skirt your destiny. So you've gone through some things that you shouldn't have seen, endured, or experienced at 13, 14, and 15 years of age. And people have no idea why it is that you have to fight off being cynical because you've seen so many people who should have protect you leave you vulnerable and still they don't understand why it is that you don't like coming around for family gatherings why you back up when they try to hug you 
why you don't stay at family functions long is because your memory still runs wide and deep and remembering moments of your life where you had to grow up fast without the benefit of Similac and mature without any understanding of your own discernment as to who you ought to stay away from and who you needed to gravitate towards. And the enemy is upset on this day because in spite of everything that you endured in your childhood, you still came out of it with an understanding of who God is. And you are not bitter, you're not resentful, you're not jealous of anybody, you're glad to be in the skin that you're in, and you don't have a moment of insecurity, and to have to do it all over again, you have no resentment, because had you not gone through that, you wouldn't be who you are today. And you ought to thank God right now. Nobody said the road was going to be easy, but he didn't bring you this far to leave you now. Do me a favor. If you had an easy childhood, don't shout with us. But if you had to climb out of ditches and holes and bricks and mortar just to be there, would you give God glory for whatever you endured that you survived it all? While horticulturalists and botanists are ecstatic about the frenzy of so many people going green, they've had to extend the warning to those who are new at trying their hand at doing gardening. Because so many don't know how difficult it is to grow some vegetables. There are three vegetables that are challenging to grow. The Bible discusses the fruit of the Spirit, but for a moment I want to explore vegetables that have their value and virtue. The first one, you may not even realize how difficult it is for it to grow, is cauliflower. Cauliflower is hard to grow. It's hard to grow, why? Because it has a long growing season. So you have to start it early enough so that it can mature in hot temperature. But it has to be late enough that you're able to harvest it before it gets cold. It's got to be in just the right temperature in order for it to grow, to maintain, and to survive. In Revelation chapter 3, verse number 16, Jesus said, because you are neither hot nor cold, I'm spewing you out of my mouth. There are some of you, it was hard for you to grow because the temperature of your house was inconsistent. It was too cold because in your house they didn't know how to express healthy affection. It was too cold because you never heard your mother say that she loved you or your father say he was proud of you. It was too cold because you did not know how to receive love that was not in fact nasty. It was too cold because you never felt as if you were enough or measured up. It was too cold because you had no words of affirmation. Had to study for yourself, excel for yourself, go to church by yourself. Or it was too warm because you were dealing with a household that was overbearing, overprotective, or wanted you to be an overachiever. So no matter what you did, you weren't even measured against their success. You were measured against their failure. And because they could not excel and do well, they poured all of their frustration into your aspiration. So you ended up picking careers and picking majors that mirrored their passion and not your desire. It was too warm because you were doing everything that they wanted you to do without ever finding out who you were in the process. Too warm because you had to live under imminent threat because they knew discipline but did not know compassion. Too warm because the house felt like a military base. You knew how to do chores and to run errands and to do your part but never knew how to communicate, never knew how to express and never knew how to open up and as a consequence you shut down before you were ever 16. Too warm, too cold 
And then you get to a church, they can't handle you when you're hot. So when you shout, they back up off you. Say that it don't take all of that. You shouldn't scream that loud. Or it's too cold that if you shout, everybody look at you like something is wrong with you. And they forgot, this is my daddy's house. I can be quiet on my job and be quiet in the store. But when I get in my father's house, I ought to shout when I want to. Because when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. Got cauliflower. Second vegetable that's hard to grow is sweet corn. Sweet corn is hard to grow because here this is cultivated across the country, but it can only develop in mindful intention. It requires, in order to grow, ample space. It's got to be planted properly. And growing up for many of you was a challenge. Here it is because you never found the space to be yourself. Never found the space to be able to pursue your dreams. Never found the space to operate in your call. Never had the space to flush out your own opinion. Never had the space to exercise your own theology. Never had the space to figure out what you wanted out of life. And then you stumbled on the prayer of Jabez. Lord, enlarge my territory. I don't know who I'm talking to, but God told me to tell you that this is the year he's knocking down walls. You have become socially claustrophobic. The walls keep coming in on you and it feels like you got no room to grow, to expand and to move and people always try to undermine your dream and they don't understand what it took for me to just get to this place. The worst thing you can say to me is if I were you, well newsflash you ain't me and because you're not me you can't dictate what I want out of my life and what I want for my children and what I want for my family I am tired of living up to other people's expectation just to be met with my own frustration so God you ain't got to deliver me from drugs or alcohol deliver me from other people's opinion because I don't care what you think if you don't like what I got on buy me something else if you don't like my hair look in another direction if you don't like who I'm with you ain't gotta be with them but for this season of my life if you don't like it Jimmy Crack Corn and I don't care I got to be happy for who I am third vessel Third vegetable hard to grow. First is cauliflower. Second is sweet corn. Third vegetable that's hard to grow is eggplant. Eggplant is hard to grow. It's the go-to for many vegetarians who prefer meatless lasagna. They'll put eggplant in it as if it tastes like chicken. This deep, dark, purple vegetable is sensitive to temperature. Watch this, it has a pressing problem because for some reason, eggplants draw and attract pests and parasites. They don't want what's on the outside of the eggplant. They have to get in it. And so in order for the pests and the parasites to get in it, it's gotta go through the head of the eggplant. So if you look at an eggplant, it almost looks like it's been shot with a pellet gun from the holes that have been bored into from pests and parasites and flea beetles that go through the head in order to damage the body. You just missed what I said. It goes through the head to damage the body. For many people who are in this room, many people who are watching online, growing up was hard. Not because of parents or siblings, but because of toxic thinking. Because of what was in your mind. And what was in your mind started eating you alive. In your mind, you began entertaining thoughts. I'm not smart enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not tall enough. 
I'm not skinny enough. I don't fit in. Something is wrong with me. I reject my own body type. I start cutting my own flesh. I start thinking about suicide. I repress my own sexuality. I deny my own genius. I ignore my own call. I'm scared about other people's approval and opinion. So in my head, I am destroying myself before I ever have an opportunity to become myself. And so I am a terrorist to the assignment of God that is in operation in my life. And Jesus said, let this mind be in you. I'm talking to somebody in this room who don't even know how dangerous you are because of the ideas that are in your head. You are not regular. You ain't a pushover. You ain't the average Joe. You ain't mediocre. You think outside of the box. You dream in another perspective. You breathe another grade of oxygen and mediocre average insignificant people can't stand you just because of your ideas and God says that this is the year that everything that's in your imagination is going to turn into manifestation some of y'all can't shout because you ain't dreaming about nothing but if you believe everything God put in my head is about to be in my hand would you shout for your dream and shout for your idea and shout for your strategy and shout for your concept. You is smart. You is kind. You is important. Would you just talk to somebody around you and tell them you is smart. You is kind. You is important. God told me to tell you this is the year that every dream you delayed is getting ready to be accelerated. If everything you put in the back burner is getting ready to come to pass. I speak over every worshiper in Newburgh that by December 31st, this is the year your dreams come true. If you believe it, shout right now. You may be seated. I'm just excited about my dream. Excited about my idea. I'm excited about my concept. I'm excited about my strategy. I'm excited about my book. I'm excited about my new business. I'm excited about my children's future. Look at the person beside you. Tell them I don't usually shout in church because other saints shout over material stuff but I'm shouting over what eyes have not seen and what ears have not heard I, I'm shouting about what he prophesied while I was still in my mother's womb there's a moral philosopher a moral philosopher's name is Susan Neiman and she wrote a book entitled why grow up subversive thoughts for an infantile age why grow up subversive thoughts for an infantile age and in it she posits that growing up only became a dilemma in the 18th century when the caste system was broken and you were free not to follow your parents footsteps Growing up comes down to this. I'm going to give you a simple definition of what growing up is. Parents, I want you to write it down. I need you to give it to your parents, to your children, when they feel like they grown. <laughs> Hallelujah. Here's what growing up is. Growing up comes down to thinking for yourself and living with the decision in spite of the consequence. Can I give it to you again? Growing up is simply this. Growing up is thinking for yourself and living with the decision in spite of the consequence. For the slow class, I'm gonna give it to you one last time. Growing up comes down to this. Thinking for yourself, living with the decision in spite of the consequence. 
I need you to lay hands on yourself, please. Repeat after me and say, I'm grown. I think for myself. I live with the decision in spite of the consequence. Come on, lay hands on yourself, declare it out loud. I'm sure grown. I think for myself. I live with the decision in spite of the consequence. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. If you glad about your decision, will you let heaven know right now, this is my decision. Much is mused about millennials taking longer to reach milestones associated with maturity. They wait longer to get married. And even though they wait longer to get married, if they get married at all, they're not waiting longer to have children because they feel like matrimony can wait, but parenting can't. You're living in a generation that's the first one in American history that is targeted to do less than their parents. So because education has become a predatory business, your children can have a bachelor's and a master's degree and still have to live at home. Not because they're lazy, not because they're unmotivated, but because we're living in a system that does not propel our young people to get on their feet for themselves. They're less likely to be financially independent. So you still now have parents taking care of grown children. And what's crazy is the children don't even feel bad about asking. When the biblical order is that the children are supposed to take care of the parents. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me today. God told me to tell you that I am getting ready to do something in your grown children. Those of y'all that got middle schoolers, y'all can't shout over this. But God says in this year, I am anointing your grown children. That your children are going to find their lane. They're going to find their assignment. And they are going to be financially independent. I need you to shout for the destiny of your grown children. That God will make them go further than anybody in your family. It's hard to grow up. It's hard to grow up when we're living in a culture and in an environment where parents want to be friends. Going to the club with their kids. Y'all getting tattoos together. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. So something is wrong when there is no level of accountability. Because I check you don't mean I'm hating on you. It means I love you. Y'all ain't saying nothing. I'm talking to those of us who were raised old school. You can do that smoking, but you ain't doing it in my house. You can cuss if you want, but not in my house. As for me and my house, we shall. Your kids ain't supposed to like you. Oh, uh, y'all, y'all ain't saying nothing to me. I said your kids are not supposed to like you. You are not a crossing guard, you are a parole officer. Make up your bed, get down here. We all go in the church, y'all ain't saying nothing. I was raised in a generation, it don't matter how late you stayed out on Sunday morning, you better get your behind up and get to church. Jesus drops, Jesus drops a jewel in Luke chapter 13, verse number six. When he starts spitting a parable, watch what he says. In Luke chapter 13, verse number six, I need you to hear what Jesus says. Media ministry, I want you to put it on the screen. I don't want them to miss it. It's a parable you done heard over and over and over again, and you never even realized the complexity of the text. Jesus starts speaking in the parable and watch what he says. He says there was a fig tree that was planted in a vineyard and he shows up looking for fruit and there was none. We find out that the gardener now wants to have it cut down 
But he said, no, give it another year. I know it's taken three years and we've not seen anything. And at no point does the gardener realize the culpability and the liability that rests on his hands. It's right there in verse number six. Media showed again, they still don't have it. And there was a man that planted a fig tree in a vineyard. And he goes there looking for fruit, but can't find any. For three years, there's absolutely nothing. And he becomes mad and says, cut it down. And the gardener said, give it one more year. Y'all still don't have it. There was a man that planted a fig tree, but he planted it in a vineyard. And he goes looking for fruit, but there is no fruit. So he tells him to cut it down. I gotta tell you this new birth is getting ready to blow your mind this time. It's the reason why the fig tree could not grow is because of where it was planted. You don't plant fig trees in vineyards because the grapes will absorb all of the nutrients before it can get to the fig tree. But the gardener said, I know it's hard for it to produce in the environment that it's in. But give it one more year. And in that one year, I'm going to help it grow in spite of where it was planted. Preach, Jamal, I'm doing the best I can. Can I tell somebody here, the devil been trying to cut you down. He thought because of where you are planted, you are not going to grow. But the devil is a lie. It was hard for me to grow, but I'm still here. Still here. I gotta tell you something. It was difficult, but you grew through it. Did you hear what I said? It was hard, but you made it. Weaker people would have collapsed and couldn't handle the pressure. There were statistics and teachers and counselors that wanted to cut you down because they didn't know what you were dealing with at home. But God said, give me another year. I know your family was dysfunctional, but you still gonna grow. You gonna go through it in spite of the alcoholism in your father, in spite of the jealousy of your siblings, in spite of what happened in your cousin's basement, in spite of you being exposed to alcohol and drugs early, you still gonna go through it. You're going to grow through it in spite of the fact you had an abortion at 13. In spite of the fact you had your first child at 15. In spite of the fact that your dad was in and out of jail. In spite of the fact that you were touched by a nasty neighbor. In spite of the fact that you were made to feel ashamed of your body. God said you still going to grow. And folk are looking at you now. Trying to figure out how did you make it when you should have lost it all and something in you tells you that you gotta tell every naysayer and every jealous family member you may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies but still like dirt I rise just like moon and suns and the certainty of tides just like the hope springing up high still I rise do you want to see me broken bowed head and lowered eyes shoulders falling down like teardrops weakened by my soul's cry you may shout me down with your words you may cut me with your eyes you may kill me with your hatefulness but still I rise I came to tell somebody rise shine give God glory for the last time I'll ask you to be seated for the last time I want you to be seated. My time is up. Hallelujah. It's difficult. But I'm going to grow through it. It's hard. It's challenging. 
but I'm gonna grow through it. I apologize because I think you've misappropriated this message. For some reason, unbeknownst to me, you thought this sermon was for you. Hallelujah. This sermon ain't for you. This sermon is for the children in your family. that you're getting ready to watch them grow into the men and women of God that they were called to be. It is God's intention that your children will go further than you. I know it looks difficult, but the enemy is not gonna have your children. He's not gonna have your son, your daughter, your niece, or your nephew. You are about to watch them grow. I'm gonna say a word. I'm speaking to the parent of every teenager in this room. Lift up that hand, you get ready to watch him grow. I bind the spirit of rebellion. Bind the spirit of rejection. The spirit of disobedience. The spirit of the absence of discipline. I speak over the life over your children. That God has given me to do a complete turnaround into everything that is connected to them. I canceled the spirit of the Antichrist that would try to make them reject the spirit of Jesus Christ. I call into authority every offspring that is the fruit of your womb that God is going to have them baptized in the spirit of the Holy Ghost. And those of you that believe this year your children are going to grow to another level, I tell you to worship for them like you believe it's going to happen. Lift up that hand. Hear me? Put your hand down. You don't know who I'm talking to yet. Lift up that hand, parent, who is distant from your child. Y'all don't speak, y'all don't get along. Y'all don't see each other. Y'all don't click, y'all don't communicate. Y'all don't relate, lift up that hand. God's getting ready to heal it. Hallelujah. I'm trying not to cry, I feel his glory right through here. In the next 21 days, get ready for the prodigal son to come home. I can't hear anybody get Get ready for a call from your daughter out of the blue. I speak reconciliation. Y'all didn't hear what I just said. I said I speak reconciliation and healing over every broken family relationship. And those of you that believe God can heal it, I need you to open up your mouth and give God glory for it. Last group and I'm gone. Those of you who still bear the scars from your childhood, I need you to lift up that hand, please. Mental abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, abandonment, being berated, dismissed, made to feel like the outside child, the mistake, the dummy, ugly, insecure, inadequate, insufficient, don't have what it takes, just like your daddy, just like your mama, had to be raised by a grandparent, brought up through foster care, lost in the system, and somehow through the grace of God you grew through it. I need you to lift up that hand. Lift up that hand. Why, Pastor? Because right now God is deleting files. 
stuff in your memory that you shouldn't even hold on to. God is now deleting it so you can be free from it. And those of you who are in this room who've had to grow through a whole lot of stuff that was unnecessary for a child but somehow through the grace of God you made it would you do me a favor please right where it is that you are it's an operating room right through here right where you are would you open up your mouth and just give God the sound of your lamentation come on I can't hear anybody right where it is that you are is that all you got y'all ain't been through nothing you ain't endured nothing. You ain't seen nothing. Hallelujah. You only got 10 seconds left. Whatever's stopping you from growing, I'm praying that God will remove it. That God will alleviate it. That God will shift it. I want to do something different. I need you to stay with me, please. With no music. Musicians, y'all aren't doing anything wrong. I just want to do something different. Here in this room, growing up was hard for you. It was difficult for you. You were planted in the wrong place. How much further would you be if you had supportive family? Where could you have gone if you were in an environment that actually valued education? What would you have achieved if they would have embraced your creativity? What would you have accomplished if they weren't threatened by your ideas? God says, I'm bringing you into the household of faith. I need you to do me a favor, please. Those of you who are in this room, growing up was hard for you. But you grew up through it. You grew over it. You grew to become who it is that God has for you. Everything that happened in your childhood was to set you up for the second Sunday in February. You didn't hear me. I said everything you went through in your life. You are not an accident. You are here by divine providence. You're here in this room. You're saying, Pastor, you got no idea. You just read my journal. I don't know where you got the key to my diary. How you got the password to my phone. But you just read the highlight clips of my whole household. And that's why I need to be in the household of faith. If you're in this room, the choir ain't singing. Musicians ain't playing. Why? Because I don't want you to make an emotional decision. I want your mind to direct your heart to override every inhibition that you had because you know this is where you can finally call home. If you're here in this room and you're saying, Pastor, I need a church home. I need to get saved. I need a father that I can depend on, that I can trust. I'm telling you, New Birth is your church. There's 4,000 churches in Atlanta, none of them like New Birth. Y'all didn't hear what I just said. 4,000. I don't care how many of them you go to, none of them are going to make you feel at home. Wherever it is that you are, deacons, elders, I need you to help me. When you come, I need you to come up in this pulpit with me, please. Wherever it is that you are, I need you to come right wherever it is that you are. You're saying, Pastor, I need to join this church today. I need to get saved today. I need to get right with God today. Leaders, when they come, bring them up in the pulpit for me. As long as they come and keep clapping.
We want to be your family. New birth, y'all got to back me up on this. We want to be your family. Because you are proficient in English while you're stuttering. Being knocked off your feet is what all of us felt last week when we got the news that Kobe Bryant and his daughter died in a helicopter crash. Knocked off our feet knowing, even while being impeached, that Trump is still in office. It'll knock you off your feet. I don't know whether you've ever had that experience, whether you've ever had that encounter, whether you're 90 years old or 19, you've had some moment that actually knocked you off your feet. I'm utterly convinced that the Heavenly Father must have some kind of foot fetish. I came to Atlanta a year ago, didn't have a place to stay, and so the church put me on a, in a hotel on Peachtree. Put me on a hotel, in a hotel on Peachtree, and every day I do three miles. While I'm doing my three miles, I keep walking past this store, and I couldn't believe the name of the store was Treat Your Feet Buckhead. Walk past it every day. Little Asian lady kept beckoning me to come in, saying, I'm gonna rub your feet. I'm new to Atlanta. It's like, Lord, what kind of spirit is here? What kind of stuff are they into? I, I never seen nothing like this. I began pleading the blood, began going into prayer. Every day I'd walk past and she said, please let me rub your feet. I say no and I just skirt on. And then one day I'm walking past and she said, well, let me rub your feet. I'm gonna do it for free. I look both ways. I whispered, can you take me right now? I went in to treat your feet, Buckhead. I took off my shoes, took off my socks. And when I did that, sitting in the chair, she then pulled out for me a chart on reflexology, which is an alternative medical practice involving the application of pressure points to specific parts of the foot. It's based on a theory that the foot is connected to certain organs and certain body parts. As it goes, the left foot is connected to the left side of the body and the right foot is connected to all the organs on the right side of the body. The belief holds that if you apply pressure to certain areas of the foot, it will immediately alleviate pain or discomfort to a specific correlating area of the body. Reflexology, not validated by any insurance company, but reflexologists defend that pressure received in the feet sends signals that places the balance of the nervous system and releases endorphins that reduces pain. So Joshua was told that every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, I'm giving it to you. I want every person, if you would, would you just lift your left foot up, lift it up even while you're seated, and I want you to place it down steadily because you don't even understand that in this moment, the same prophecy of Joshua just got released over you. God said, I am now giving you territory that you didn't even have before this. I can't believe y'all didn't shout about it. I said, God just gave you new territory that you previously did not have. The pressure you are presently under is preparation for the platform you are about to be over. I think I said it too fast. The pressure you are under is preparation for the platform you are about to be over. I'm prophesying while I'm preaching. In Exodus chapter three, 
Moses is tending sheep. And watch what the Lord says to Moses. He says, take your shoes off. And I need you to see what is happening here in the story. He tells Moses, take off your shoes, take off your sandals, but they are on the mountainside. And the mountainside that they're on has broken glass. And God says, take off your shoes. The mountainside has chipped rocks. And God says, take off your shoes. The mountainside, hear this, has scorpions. And God says, take off your shoes. Because what God was saying to Moses is what he's saying to you. Is you now have authority, here it is, over what was designed to hurt you. And so you're able to walk through some stuff that other people would have crumbled over and folk have no idea how it is that you able to high step through trauma and disappointment and heartbreak and setbacks and broken promises and you're still standing and they don't understand I did this with my shoes off there there is glory on my life that you cannot interrupt I remember, I remember hearing the scampering of feet slide across the laminate floors of a prestigious religious leader in Luke chapter, it's Luke chapter seven. This prestigious religious leader was hosting a private dinner party that was invitation only. The guest of honor was our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and yet I keep hearing the scampering of feet in the background. Those feet belong to an uninvited guest, a woman with a sullied reputation. She slipped in through the back door because she had no invitation. And yet, she got in. I want you to lift up that hand right where you are. I want to speak something over your life and only 500 of you will receive it. Those of you that got faith, you better respond to it. God said, this is the season where all you need is a foot in the door. You, you, you don't even need it open if they just leave it cracked. And here's your shout. God said, I'm going to put you where they didn't want you, where they tried to block you, where they thought that you were not qualified. But y'all better get yourself together. Why? Because your foot is getting ready to get through the door. Somebody, I don't know whether it was the catering staff, don't know whether it was housekeeping, but they left the door unlocked. She slipped in through the back door because all she needed was a foot in the door. And once she got in, she found where Jesus was in the room. She found where Jesus was in the room and watch what the text tells us in Luke 7 verse 38. She's behind him. And when she's behind Jesus, she breaks down and starts crying. Every now and again, you ought to be crying when you are in the presence of God. And you ought to be crying, why pastor? You ought to be crying when you realize what's behind you. Some of y'all can't cry because you're still in it. But I need some people in here that know when I look back over my life, when I seen the stuff that I endured, the shots that I've taken, what people knowingly tried to do to break me, but I give God glory, why? Cause it's behind me now. I'm forgetting those things which are behind and I press. Crying, hear this, crying is an act of surrendered worship. Crying is an avalanche of emotions. Sometimes you cry while you're sitting in the car and nobody done nothing to you but you begin to weep until you're not even consolable. I need somebody who ever had to sit in your bed and cry. 
I need somebody that ever sat in your car, sat in the shower. Sometimes you can be in the middle of worship in church and tears will start coming down your face and you don't even know why you cry. But when I'm crying, I don't need you to give me a tissue. I don't even need you to hug me. I need you to back up off me so I can get this off my system because I'm purging myself from some stuff that I've been in. Crying is an overwhelming emotion. I'm crying and when you see me crying in church, it's not because I'm sad. I'm crying because I'm set free. See, sometimes when I cry, it don't have nothing to do with tears. But I'm crying out to God because my soul needs a relief. Some of y'all don't believe it. There were two blind men who were by the side of the road and they heard Jesus was passing by. And the Bible said that they cried, Son of David, have mercy on me. So when you hear me worshiping in church and I'm crying out unto God, I'm crying out to God because I need him, here it is, to show me what I can't see. And I need somebody in this room that needs God to show you something this week. Would you cry out loud like you need him to show you something? Hallelujah. My worshipers are coming in just one moment, but you'll see it wasn't just one man crying. There were two men crying by the side of the road. Would you look at the person beside you and say, don't let me worship by myself. There's power in agreement. If both of us cry out unto God and we do it at the same time, God ain't going to do it for one of us. He's going to do it for both of us. Don't you sit today by somebody that ain't a worshiper. Sit today by somebody that will cry. Lord, show me something. Hallelujah. Be seated, please. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy God. I feel something getting ready to break right through here. If you don't need nothing, don't say nothing. The sound you get ready to hear is getting ready to upset the spirit of the Antichrist. Oh, y'all ain't saying nothing. I found another person crying. This man was crying in Mark's gospel. In Mark's gospel, this can be the craziest shout you've ever given in church. He's crying out unto God, watch this, because he wants to get rid of his demons. He said, there's some stuff in me that ain't right. And I need God to pull it out of me. And I can't sit in here acting cute. But I'm sick of this nasty spirit, this lying spirit, this bitter spirit, this jealous spirit. So I'm crying out unto God, Lord, if there's anything in me that's not like you, pull it out of me. Stay in stories, please. Hallelujah. Some of y'all can't shout. Cause you think you perfect? Cause you were born in the choir loft? Cause you ain't got no demons? But I need 500 of y'all that are sick of being attacked by the enemy. You had me last year, but I'm not carrying these demons in 2020. God, pull it out of me. Thank you, Holy God. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Church people can always see other people's stuff, but can't see their own issue. I need you to pull on whoever's next to you and tell them you sat by the right worshiper. When I cry out unto God, 
every demonic attack that has been levied on your life is coming out of your system. When you cry out in here, everything that's in you that is not pure, that is not holy, that is not righteous, This is the first time you ever said it out loud, but I came to kill a demon today. I need a thousand of you to shout out loud, I'm free of my demons. I'm, I'm, come on, I can't hear nobody. I dare you to shout it out loud. I'm free of my demons. He's crying. She's crying out under God. And it helps us to understand what we've been saying in church but never understood. I am anointed. How's this? Where? From the top of my head. Where else? To the sole of my feet. I am anointed from the top of my head. God help me, to the sole of my feet. Y'all get back, get it in a minute. I am anointed from the top of my head to the sole of my feet. Now stay with me, because you don't even know why you shout. The soles of your feet are connected to all of your internal organs. God, yell me, God said, so when you worship me, none of your organs will fail. That whatever is going on on the inside of you is getting ready to be restored. Who ought to be shouting now? Those of y'all that got trouble with your kidney, trouble with your liver, trouble with your pancreas, trouble with your heart, you ought to be shouting, cause I am anointed. She's, uh, she's crying. And the text says she's crying and she's behind Jesus. She's behind Jesus, watch this and changes her position. She changes her position and then goes in front of him. When you are in authentic worship, your position will change. And everybody focuses on the alabaster box and they ignore her tears. She uses the tears and uses the tears, watch this, to moisten her hair. The Bible said that a woman's hair, here it is, is her glory. I told y'all I'm teaching on worship today. So I only know how to give God glory through pain. If I ain't been through nothing, I can't worship God. But anybody who knows there will be glory after this, that there will be. Yeah. She gets in front of them. Jesus is sitting there, and I need you to see what he does. He's sitting there, not even moving. And she does something that messed me up. She starts rubbing his feet. It never made sense to me till I went in that little store on Peachtree. <laughs> Why is she rubbing his feet? She's, she's rubbing his feet, watch this, not because there's something wrong with him. She's putting pressure on the feet of God because there's something going on with her. God help me, y'all. Y'all missed it. 
Everybody sees she's crying, but they don't know what she's crying about. I think I lost you. When I worship God, it ain't your business what I'm giving God glory for. But when I give him glory, I'm in pressure. with me. So when I worship him, when I worship him out of my pain, I worship him through my internal distress. I am adding pressure to God that you got to deal with something that's going on inside of me. See, some of y'all, when you see us shouting, you think that everything is all good. When I'm shouting, it's because I'm trying to make it better. Y'all getting ready to miss that thing. When I give God glory, I'm putting pressure on the feet of God. Saying, God, you know what I'm dealing with. You know how hard it is. You know the struggle I'm on. Watch what's getting ready to happen. There's getting ready to be a sound of worship in this room that's getting ready to mess some people up. If you don't need nothing, don't say nothing. But God said your worship ought to match the pain of the struggle of what you're dealing with on the inside. You only got 60 seconds, I'm telling you. I want every person in the room that's putting a mandate on the Father. God, I need this handled. I need this resolved. I need this fixed. Would you give him glory and worship him until he feels the pressure? Hey. Hey. Put pressure on him. I'm waiting on my worshipers. Put pressure on them. I need you to turn it up. Make God handle your son. Make God deal with your daughter. Make God force to look at your bills. Put pressure on them. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Ghost. You may be seated. You may be seated. You may be seated. Hallelujah. How much? Hey. How much? Hey. You may be seated. Put pressure on. Hey. I said put pressure on. I said put pressure on. Watch God do it. I need you to lift up that hand. Open up your mouth. God, you got to get me out of this contract. You got to get me out of this house. You got to get me out of this relationship. Put pressure on them. Jesus. Keep worshiping them. I got to show you this. She's adding pressure to the feet of God. And the church people get mad. <laughs> Saying they shouldn't do all of that. I can't see. All that screaming is unnecessary. I wish they would sit down somewhere. And Jesus said, who you think you are? I've been in your presence for almost two hours and you ain't worship me yet. But there's somebody in the room that needs my glory. I don't know where you are, but if you ain't going home the same way you came, put some pressure on. She puts pressure on the feet of God. 
Because what she's dealing with is not anything external. It's something internal. God has given me to sweep through this room in 90 seconds or less. But those of you who are dealing with something going on in your internal body, hallelujah. Dealing with something in your internal body, here it is. I need you to, by faith, would you just start laying hands on yourself? Hallelujah. I'm putting pressure on it. This ain't for nothing material, it ain't nothing tangible. I need God to touch my mind. I need God to deal with my heart. My spirit been off for the last six months. I need God to deal with it. God said, you're doing it, but you ain't applying tears to it. You're not letting me feel and experience your pain in it. It's only going to be 60 seconds. Watch this. God says, today, I'm getting ready to stop internal bleeding. Because the folk around you got no clue what you're dealing with. But God said, when you worship me, hear this, before you get back to your car, the matter is going to be resolved. I don't know who this is for, but it's only going to be 60 seconds of worship at the feet of God. I don't care what you got to do. If you got to lay prostrate, if you got to lift your hand, if you got to cry out loud, but I want you to show me what would you do to apply pressure. You only got 60 seconds. Open up your mouth and cry out unto God. God, deal with this. You only got 10 seconds left with no music. Let me hear the sound of worshipers. Apply pressure with no music. 10 seconds, open up your mouth. Lift up that hand, please. Lift up that hand right where you are. Jesus said to the woman, I did an autopsy while you were worshiping. And I finally figured out what was wrong with you. I know what you're contending with, what you're dealing with. And I'm gonna say this. It's what Jesus said to the woman is what I'm saying to 2,000 of you. And when you get this word of release, I hope that you'll celebrate it. He didn't say to this woman, you are now debt free. He didn't say to the woman, you are now a millionaire. He didn't say to the woman, you're going to find the man of your dreams by Valentine's Day. Watch what he said to the woman is what are you saying to new birth today? He said, because you applied pressure to me. Because you touched me while you were in pain. I'm going to give you a happy ending.
I don't know who needs this load taken off of you, but I'm telling you, y'all better tear this roof clear off. God said, because of how you shouted, here's your release. All of your sins are forgiven. God, I can't hear nobody. Whatever you did last year, whatever you did last night, whatever you did last week, all of your sin. All your sins are forgiven. And I didn't do it for the church people. Because they act like they ain't got no demons. And they act like they're not dealing with anything. Lift that hand in worship. I want to speak this over you and them. I release you. I pray over every lifted hand as your pastor that over the next 48 to 72 hours God will begin to alleviate the pressure you have been under. I really thought y'all would shout better than that. Said he's going to alleviate all of the undue stress that you have been under. I declare and decree over every lifted hand, whatever your enemies have tried to hold over your head, God said in this next shout, nothing is over your head, it's now under your feet. And those of y'all that receive the word of the Lord, I dare to just dance on it. I, I dare to just jump on it. I, I dare to just celebrate it. That is now under your feet. I want you to stand. I'm finished. I'm just not through. I need you to stand. Life has a way of knocking you off your feet. One week ago today, Kobe Bryant and his family were, y'all not gonna believe it, were taking communion. One week ago today at this time. And had no idea that hours after communion, it will be their last day on earth. I don't open the doors of the church because most of us in this room may never be on a helicopter. But you're always going to be on the road of life. And I want you to know that um, you are worth dying for. That you're so valuable to God that he interrupted accidents you couldn't even see. And he did it with no pressure. You're here in this room and you need to get saved. You need to give your life over to God. You slipped in. Life has tried to make you ashamed of what you've done and what you, who you were with. But all you needed was a foot in the door. You're in this room and you're saying, Pastor, you have no idea. You have no idea that you were talking to me. I'm talking to those of you in this room who have cried but ran out of tears. I'm saying to you forthrightly, unapologetically, unashamedly, I want to be your pastor. I'm telling you more than anything, I want Jesus to be your Lord. I'm telling you, I want you to be a part of the family, the community known as New Birth. If you're in this room, you're saying, Pastor, this is where I belong. This is where I'm supposed to be. 
This is where I'm going to grow in God. That's where you are. Would you slip out of that aisle? Don't stop until you meet me at this altar. I need you to come right now, wherever it is that you are. Whoever it is that you are, I need you to come. Come on, clap your hands as they come. Listen to me. Nothing in your life happened by accident. This is a good place for me to remind you that all things work together for good to those that love him and are called according to his purpose. New birth, I hope you'll celebrate a little bit better, a little bit louder than that. Would you all pull in two steps for me? Pull in two steps. I need you to know visitors, friends, saints, those of you who are viewing online. I don't know where you are, I don't know where you're located, where you're situated. Early this morning, I met the leaders of our church in prayer and we prayed for you. We prayed not only that you would get here, we prayed that you would get saved. We prayed that you would join the church. We prayed, we put pressure on God that your life would be completely altered by your experience in worship today. Here's what I need y'all to do. Hear me, please. I want you to apply positive peer pressure. You're gonna apply positive peer pressure. I want you to move around in your row, in your section. I want you to find three people who you don't know. Find three people you never met before. Three people you got no history with. I want you to walk right up on them and find out if they're saved. Find out if they got a church home. Find out if they've given their life over to God. Every person is doing that. Every person is moving. Y'all ain't talking to nobody. Y'all really gonna act like that? There's somebody here. I need you to come. Somebody here. I need you to come. Those of you who are viewing online, I want you to become a part of our family. Go to newbirth.org right now. Get connected right now. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Come on, clap your hands, they're still coming. I'm almost finished. I'm just waiting on three more people to come. When those three come, I'm going to release you. Would you look at the people around and tell them, hurry up and get saved. Hurry up and join the church. Hurry up and get your life together. If you're here, I need you to come quickly, please. All have sinned and fallen short of his glory. New birth, would you stretch your right hand to faith? Don't do it yet, I need you to clap. They still coming in the aisles. God bless you. Come on, come on, come on. Even at the risk of getting on somebody's nerves, would you just ask the person on your left, ask the person on your left, are you sure you saved? Sure you got a church on? You can't lie with communion on your breath, come on now. 
We've been forgiven. Stretch your right hand to faith and let's try it again. Stretch your right hand to faith. Repeat after me. You're in the right place at the right time. John in the right church. Serving the only God. And I know that's right. If you know I'm right, come on, declare, show you're right. I want those of you who are here, if you'll follow us this way, new birth, come on, make some noise. They came as friends. They leave them as family. Bless the Lord.